Tonight, the president-elect, cheered by the nation and hailed by the chief. It'll be a stirring sight to watch President Obama, his wife Michelle, and their beautiful girls step through the doors of the White House. But who will help him run that White House? I'm Katie Couric. Also tonight, the latest on who might be in line for top positions in the Obama administration. They've lost the presidency and will have even fewer seats in Congress. Can the GOP rise from the ashes of campaign 08? And his great imagination entertained us with everything from Jurassic Park to ER. The death of doctor turned author Michael Crichton. This is the CBS Evening News with Katie Couric reporting tonight from CBS News Election Headquarters in New York. And this is an expanded edition. Good evening, everyone. We're on for one hour tonight. In 76 days, Barack Obama will be sworn in as the 44th president of the United States. After his historic election victory, he began working today on the transition. President Bush promised full cooperation and congratulated the president-elect on a, quote, impressive victory. He got more than half the popular vote, and with Missouri and North Carolina still uncalled, Mr. Obama has 79 more electoral votes than he needed to win the presidency. The Democrats added 17 seats to their majority in the House of Representatives and five seats in the Senate. Though even with races in Alaska, Georgia, Minnesota, and Oregon still uncalled, they're not expected to reach a 60-seat filibuster-proof supermajority. As for voter turnout, CBS News estimates it will total a record 133 million or more. That's 57 percent of the voting age population. Barack Obama is about to inherit a world of challenges, and Dean Reynolds begins our coverage tonight. In Chicago, Barack Obama was on the road again, but for the man of the hour, he was practically reclusive with only a brief sighting. And with the whole world waiting for his next move, somebody asked the president-elect if he'd had enough sleep last night. Too bad, because now starts the hard part. This president goes into office with more expectations than any president I can ever remember in my lifetime. Obama's agenda includes middle-class tax cuts, a new health insurance plan, improved schools, and energy independence, to say nothing of ending the war in Iraq and refocusing the military on Afghanistan. All of it amid an economic downturn that defies easy remedy. But Obama is well aware of the challenge. The road ahead will be long. Our climb will be steep. We may not get there in one year or even in one term. A transition team is working today in Chicago, joined by Vice President-elect Biden, and will be facing pressure for a quick pick at Treasury to establish confidence. Already, there's word that Congressman Rahm Emanuel, a fierce Democratic partisan, may become White House Chief of Staff. And a stronger Democratic Congress awaits, though that could be a mixed blessing. Democrats are a party of various factions, and a lot of folks have been out of power for a long time. and. Uh, Different people want different things. Last night, Obama acknowledged that he needs Republicans' help, and today the Republicans agreed, in a way. He'll need Republicans' help, fighting back the rigid, liberal orthodoxy of his congressional leadership. For Barack Obama, the crowds have departed and the cheering has died down. But soon enough, the sounds will be replaced by insistent demands for action. Barack Obama is about to learn a lesson all new presidents are taught, that promising and delivering are two different things. Katie? Dean Reynolds, thanks very much, Dean. As for the Republicans, they'll have less power in Congress, and they're about to lose control of the White House. Their hopes of keeping it ended last night in Phoenix. The question now is, can they rise like one out of the ashes of defeat? Here's Chip Reed. John McCain awoke to a dramatically different world today than the one he had envisioned. Driving himself out of the garage of his Phoenix condo building, he had no entourage, no secret service, and no comment, following his gracious concession on election night to Barack Obama. The American people have spoken, and they have spoken clearly. I had the honor of calling Senator Barack Obama to congratulate him, please, to congratulate him on being elected that from members of a party that is now demoralized and for the most part leaderless. A long campaign has now ended and we move forward as one nation. 
President Bush also called for unity, but he is now not only deeply unpopular, he's a full-fledged lame duck, as he himself made clear. And when the time comes on January the 20th, Laura and I will return home to Texas with treasured memories of our time here. Some Republicans adjusting to their sideline status seem to be relying on the Democrats to self-destruct. The last two times Democrats controlled the House, Senate, and the presidency, they choked on the bone of responsibility. Many in the party's conservative base hope the leadership void can be filled by Sarah Palin and have urged her to run for president in four years. So far, she's not taking the bait. 2012, that, that sounds like years away. Available now, we got a bunch of these. But it's a hot topic with late night comics, especially Saturday Night Live's Tina Fey, who recently lampooned the idea with the real John McCain right by her side. Just try and wait until after Tuesday to wear them, okay? <laughs> because I am not going anywhere. And I'm certainly not going back to Alaska. In fact, the real Sarah Palin did fly back to Alaska this afternoon. Before getting on the plane, she told reporters the election of Barack Obama is an historic moment, and she said, quote, it's time we all work together to help America reach her destiny. Katie? All right, Chip Reed. Chip, thanks very much. So, how did Barack Obama do it? Simply put, his money and organization helped him succeed in places where Al Gore and John Kerry failed. Here's our senior political correspondent, Jeff Greenfield. In the end, it came down to this. Barack Obama won the presidency because he expanded the political map, holding every Democratic state while capturing eight Bush states, including some that Democrats rarely, if ever, competed, much less win. But how did Obama do this? By going on offense within these states, competing in places where Democrats have been all but endangered species. It is great to be back in Florida. Look at Florida's Duval County, the Jacksonville area. Four years ago, Bush won that county with nearly 58% of the vote. This year, it was a virtual dead heat. In Orange County, in the heart of the battleground I-4 corridor, Bush and Kerry had tied four years ago. This year, Obama buried McCain. Hello, Terre Haute. In Indiana, Vigo County on the west went for Bush over Kerry by seven points. This year, it went for Obama by 16 points. In Vanderburg, to the southwest, an 18-point Bush win turned into a slight victory for Obama. Hello, Nevada! In Nevada, Washoe County had gone for Bush by six points. It went for Obama by 12. The not-so-secret weapons, money, $300 million more of it than McCain had, that enabled him to dispatch an army of staff and volunteers in these states. 44 offices in Indiana compared to one for McCain, 15 for Obama in Nevada, and four for McCain. And given how close the margin was in many states, Obama won by two points in Florida, by one point in Indiana, these advantages were crucial. This election would have been a nail biter if it weren't for the enormous advantage that Obama had in resources and manpower. Which raises a question, can future campaigns adapt this tactic or does it take a special kind of candidate and campaign environment to make it work, Katie? I'll, I'll take the bait. Can this strategy be replicated or was it a perfect storm of an unpopular president, bad economy and a candidate who could take advantage of both those things? Yeah, I think it's more the latter. I don't think this is a one size fits all. You need somebody who inspires and you need a situation where people desperately want to come out and change the situation. Uh, so I don't think this is going to work for just, you know, any modular candidate. Much to the chagrin of a lot of future candidates, right, Jeff? Well, this was one for the books. The, the Obama campaign organization did one of the most brilliant jobs of figuring out how to use new technology anybody's ever seen. Studied for decades, I'm sure. Jeff Greenfield, thanks. As Dean Reynolds mentioned earlier, Barack Obama's first order of business will be putting together an administration, beginning with his cabinet. Our chief White House correspondent, Jim Axelrod, has that story. The peaceful transfer of power, a hallmark of our democracy, began today with President Bush pledging his complete cooperation to President-elect Obama. It will be a stirring sight to watch President Obama, his wife Michelle and their beautiful girls step through the doors of the White House. That's 76 days away, meaning the clock's already ticking for Mr. Obama to assemble his cabinet. The economy puts his choice for Treasury Secretary under the most scrutiny. Two former Clinton Treasury Secretaries top the list, Robert Rubin and Larry Summers as well as Tim Geithner, who runs the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. He's well thought of on Wall Street. Paul Volcker, who ran the Fed under Carter and Reagan, is also getting a look. 
Abraham Lincoln, he was a Republican. He was pretty good. So, so I'm going to be looking for the absolute best people. That's Mr. Obama has hinted he'd keep with recent practice and appoint a member of the other party to his cabinet. That might mean asking President Bush's defense secretary, Robert Gates, to stay. But just a couple of weeks ago, Gates said he was going home. Well, let me just say that I'm getting a lot more career advice and counseling uh, than I might have anticipated. Uh, I think I'll leave it at that. I'm still planning on heading to Washington State. If he does, or even if he agrees to stay for a short time, keep an eye on Richard Danzig, a secretary of the Navy under Bill Clinton. John Kerry and Bill Richardson are two big names being considered for Secretary of State. Senator Richard Lugar, a former chair of the Foreign Relations Committee, gives Obama a Republican option. And at Justice, either Eric Holder, a Clinton Justice Department official, or Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick would be the first African-American Attorney General. Arizona Governor Janet Napolitano is also under consideration. President-elect Obama has told his aides he wants to take his time choosing a cabinet. He doesn't want to seem rushed. He doesn't want to be rushed. Look for him to name his cabinet after Thanksgiving, not before. Katie? And it will be fascinating to watch. Jim Axelrod at the White House tonight. Thanks, Jim. On the CBS Money Watch, after the big Election Day rally, recession fears returned to Wall Street today. The Dow gave back all of yesterday's gains and then some. Still ahead, right here on the CBS Evening News, a celebration that was generations in the making. The celebration we saw overnight were like none we had ever seen. In many towns in America, it was as if they just won the World Series. But then the country has never seen an election like this one. Here's our national correspondent, Byron Pitts. It's hard to capture it in a headline or in an overhead shot. But when was the last time? It's been a long time coming. Our nation cheered this much. Change has come to America. wept this long. From a park in Chicago, a church basement in Cleveland, a church where the pastor's own distant cousin was shot and killed for simply trying to vote in 1930. It sends chills up my spine. To Ann Nixon Cooper's living room, President-elect Obama called her by name. I stayed up to listen for it. Ann Nixon Cooper is 106 years old. To a suburban home in Decorah, Iowa. <laughs> Iowa, the state that first bought into Obama's audacious hopes. Thank you, Iowa. And where lifelong Democrat like Dev Tika and a lifelong Republican like Brenda Meyer made a toast with champagne. 2008, <laughs> Iowa. I just think it just kind of shows what Brenda and I have gone through the same way the country has gone through. The fact that we can have our differences, we can discuss them, and we can come together with a common goal. For Barack Obama, that goal started with a speech near the very same steps where Lincoln once spoke. I stand before you today to announce my candidacy for President of the United States of America. Just words that energized so many, made we use can. of so much. Yes, yes we, we can. can. Yes, yes, we, yes can. we can. Yes, the road had its moments. I was fighting these fights. Some heartfelt. I have so many opportunities from this country. Some hurtful. Not God bless America. Old demons and new ones. What Barack Obama started actually began long ago. Out of the huts of history, shame, the poet wrote. A history reflected upon inside Atlanta's historic Ebenezer Baptist Church last night. The church where Dr. King once preached of dreams. Dreams his longtime friend, Reverend Joseph Lowry, finally saw come true. The minute the card clicked out of the voting machine, it dawned on me I had just voted for an African American, for president, for the 44th president of the United States, and I froze, and out of my mouth came hallelujah. That history was on the minds of millions of Americans last night. People like Sandra Hollinger Samuels of Minnesota. We first met her at the Democratic Convention this summer, the night Obama's name was put into nomination. 
Then and now, she remembered what her father might say. He would say, "San, God Almighty, <laughs> I can't believe it." You know, I mean, he would. Um, he would be so. He would be so proud. Her father is actually still alive. At 72, Alzheimer's is stealing away Richard Hollinger's mind and his memories. But not ours, not his daughter's. It's more than I ever thought that it, that it could be, you know? I mean, the, uh, the words on our Constitution are coming to life, you know, in a real tangible way. We the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, that's what the Constitution says. Last night, all across America, for so many people, that's how it felt. A more perfect union. Byron Pitts, CBS News, New York. Doctors are often criticized for their writing, but when Michael Crichton put pen to paper, well, he created an amazing world of entertainment as he blended science and his imagination into a long series of best-selling books, movies, and TV shows. Crichton died of cancer yesterday in Los Angeles. He was 66. Richard Schlesinger has his story. Michael Crichton seemed equally at home in the future and the past, in truth and in fiction, in what if and what's next. He wrote more than 25 books, a TV show, and about a dozen films. It's hard to say what he's best known for. Jurassic Park, a blockbuster about clone dinosaurs who are brought back to life, grossed somewhere around $350 million. Boy, do I hate being right all the time. I was talking to friends at MIT and saying, you know, I have this idea about engineering dinosaurs and saying it very tentatively. And, and some of them said, yeah, I don't know, it'll probably work. Previously on ER. The creator of ER was himself an MD with a Harvard degree. While he was still a medical student, he turned out a novel about a deadly virus threatening the world. The Andromeda strain was his first bestseller and first hit film. Birds will eat the infected flesh and then fly off and spread the disease. If it is a disease. Technology, biotech, tension, and terror were the centerpieces of a lot of his work. And the truth is, just about everything he wrote became a hit. I don't really understand how it happens, and if I did, I'd make it happen more often. It happened pretty often for Michael Crichton, who won almost every award he could and one other honor. Six years ago, scientists named a dinosaur for him. Not a bad way to recognize the man who brought prehistory to life. Richard Schlesinger, CBS News, New York. From writing to painting and the artist behind a portrait of the president-elect. Enduring images of Campaign 08 is this one of Barack Obama. And there's a story behind it. Bill Whitaker has a portrait of the artist. That Barack Obama image, it's here, there, everywhere it seems this year. This has become the iconic image of the campaign. It's more having to do with Obama than it's having to do with me. It's the handiwork of modest L.A. street artist Shepard Ferry, who says he had no grand design but to draw people, especially young people, into this election. Having the shadows fall in red on the one side of the face and in blues on the other side of the face to symbolize a merging of the blue states and the red states, I think was powerful. How powerful? His original run of 350 posters mushroomed to 400,000 and counting. It went viral on the internet, even spawning copycats. It's a mainstream hit for an artist who usually runs on the wild side, staging guerrilla art attacks across the country, plastering his images on any empty space. I've been arrested several times for doing street art, but... How many times? Uh, four, fif fifteen. So, before he spread Obama's image around, he did something he's never done before. He asked permission. When they said, 
hey, we like your stuff. Go ahead, make a poster. Then I said, okay, well, now it's on them. If something bad happens, not on me. <laughs> and the icing on the cake for Shepard Ferry, even more than the results of last night's election. When I met Obama, he said, I love this image. And how did you get it spread around so fast? As an artist, he says he's always skeptical. Yet you have hope under Obama, which I would take you mean genuinely. Oh, I absolutely mean hope genuinely. And um, I'm not saying Obama's going to solve everything, but I just think it's an improvement in the political culture. Political culture meet pop culture. A thousand words couldn't say it better. Bill Whitaker, CBS News, Los Angeles. Some CBS stations will be leaving us now, but for many of you, this expanded edition of the CBS Evening News will continue in a moment.